Fair call to order the meeting of Mayor and Council. Thank you all for being here and those joining online. If you'll rise for the invocation by Councilman McCoy. If you would, please bow your heads. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your name. Lord, if you would continue to bless our world, country, this city, and our community. Lord, please provide us the knowledge you wish to give us to make proper decisions for our city. Lord, please continue to watch over our local police department and thank you for our new officers here this evening. Please watch over them and provide them your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Please remain standing for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Okay, do we have any changes to tonight's agenda? No, sir, we do not. Okay, as a reminder to council, we do have an executive session right after this. Each of you received our minutes from our last meeting. If there are no questions or comments, I'll accept the motion to receive the minutes. Councilman Dan Henderson, so moved. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Councilman Matt McCoy, I will second that motion. Okay, all right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, okay, it's unanimous. All right, we're going to call up... Chief Kraft to introduce our new officers. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, tonight I'm very proud to uh, introduce the council and the audience to two new hires for the Seaford Police Department. Back in uh, December of 2019, we actually hired Bernadine Dice uh, to work in our call center. He went through the police department process was a successful candidate, and he was hired to be a police officer in March of this year. Uh, due to COVID-19, there were some delays in the academy start date, so uh, we got through it. Bernadine Dice graduated from the police academy and was uh, officially uh, given the oath of office on Thursday, October 1st, by the mayor and vice mayor uh, and witnessed by other members here in the, the room today. So Bernadine Dice, if you could come up to the podium, I'd like to introduce you to each of the council members. Councilman Jose Santos, Vice Mayor Dan Henderson. Nice. Thanks. Yes, all. Thank you. Councilman Holland and Councilman McCoy. And if you, uh, if you could just, uh, yes, it's fine. Have a seat, and I'll introduce <laughs> Dalton. I'll call you back up for pictures. I apologize. <laughs> Dalton Willie. Dalton Willie is a certified. Dalton, stand on up. Dalton is a certified police officer. He came to us uh, from the Harrington Police Department. He has been a certified police officer for approximately four years. Uh, I know his dad. His dad is the chief of police for Wyoming Police Department. He comes from good stock. He's going to do a really good job for the city of Seaford. We're very proud to have Dalton here today. And Dalton, I'd like to introduce you once again to the members of the council and the mayor. I'll let you sit down, then I'll call you back up. Hey, could you guys come back <laughs> Of course. Up? So the mayor and vice mayor have a presentation that we would like to present you with tonight. Uh, most of you probably haven't been into a swearing-in of an officer, but it's a, it's a big deal. These, these guys and gals have worked long and hard and been away from their families. Uh, our chief does a great job of making it a big deal and how proud we are to have them on our team. Uh, this is an official copy of their oath, much like what you did when you were sworn in to be a elected. Uh, theirs is a little different, even a little more serious, uh, but it's a big deal. So the chief had these framed up and we'd like to present them and get a picture with all of us just to honor you being part of the Seaford Police Department.
might have some family here. If you'd like to have them come up, take a picture with the chief, that would reduce the time if you'd like to do that. Yes. Give our two new officers a round of applause to welcome them. Okay, do we have any correspondence? No, sir, we do not. Okay, next, first on our agenda is the annexation of the Sunrise Motel. Okay, so I'd like to present for Council's consideration tonight ordinance number 2020-A1, and this is an ordinance outlining the annexation of tax map and parcel 331-3.00-180.00, or otherwise known as 22512 Sussex Highway, the Sunrise Motel. There's a picture of it there. Um, council has, is aware we've been going through the annexation process now for the last several months. We started um, back in the summer, and this is the culmination of that process as required by our city charter. We have had a public hearing on this item at the last <clears throat> council meeting. Council did recommend we move forward uh, this project has been reviewed by planning and zoning. It also has been, uh, the plan of services has been presented to the state of Delaware and they did recommend annexation. We also have letters in the file from the chief of police as well as the fire department that they support the annexation. This ordinance lays out the boundaries that will be established and extended at the city of Seaford. This parcel consists of 1.64 plus or minus acres by the survey. It's also denoted in Exhibit A that will be attached to the ordinance. And if council adopts this ordinance, the process will be that it'll be advertised and the ordinance will become effective 30 days after advertisement and the property will be annexed uh, with a majority vote of the city council. We then, if that occurs, we then will notify all the, uh, we'll notify the state agencies, we'll notify Delmarva Power, for, uh, to, to change our um, electrical territory so we can service them, if it's them. Um, and there's a, there's a whole list of people that we uh, notify during an annexation. They will then become part of our boundaries after that 30-day annexation period. So all of our codes and ordinances will apply as well as our um, <coughs> process for redevelopment should they want to occur. I certainly can answer, attempt to answer any questions that any member of council might have. Okay, are there any questions in reference to this property annexing into the city of Seaford? Yes, sir. Uh, Councilman Henderson, I have a question on, uh, on order. Uh, section 6 says that it should be at least two-thirds of the members. Um, a, majority, a majority voting tonight. Um, since we have one absent, is it, a, is it a majority of all members or is it a two-thirds majority of voting members? I assume it's a, it's a, we can't have a meeting without a quorum, but then once a quorum is present, it would be a 
two-thirds of the members that are present because okay. it's a legal meeting that we're having. Yeah, correct. All right. Thank That's you. the way my interpretation would be. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? If not, I'll accept the motion. Uh, I yield. <laughs> Councilman McCoy, I'll make the motion to adopt ordinance number 2020-A1 for the annexation of tax map and parcel number 331-3.00-180.00 at 22512 Sussex Highway, also known as Sunrise Motel, C for Delaware, 19973, as presented. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Councilman Henderson, a second. Okay, thank you. Tracy, can we have a roll call vote, please? Aye. Councilman Henderson. Aye. Councilman Holland. Aye. Councilman McCoy. Aye. Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you very much. All right, next I'll call up the chief to go over uh, an unbudgeted expense for body cameras. <clears throat> Good evening again. Good, Good evening. evening. <clears throat> Just earlier, we had discussed uh, a uh, unbudgeted expenditure request for council's consideration to move forward with the purchase of a integrated body worn and in-car camera system for the Seaford Police Department. As the uh, city manager explained, we do have an aging in-car current camera system. We also have in our operating account monies uh, of about $8,000 set aside to replace one of those aging units uh, this fiscal year. Um, what the proposal was made is for council's consideration to move forward with the purchase of a watch guard integrated in-car camera body worn camera system and uh, the proposal uh, or the quote that we received that I would be supporting tonight is uh, related to a uh, contract for a five-year payback at zero percent interest the cost total cost for the uh, in-car camera body worn camera as well as an interview room camera system was $166,385, which breaks down to $33,277 per year. So according to the quote and the lease uh, option that was proposed to us, we wouldn't actually have to make a payment until August the 1st of uh, 2021, which would be into the next fiscal year. So to offset the cost, um, we have what's called violent crime funds uh, that um, I have proposed uh, to go back before the board to make a request to reallocate uh, the difference uh, between what I'm asking for tonight. I'm asking for $15,000 of unbudgeted expenditure money, which is actually offset by the 8,000 already budgeted. And uh, to seek counsel uh, from violent crime funds approval to reallocate the difference um, from our current grant. And so if the council were to review this after we're done and they were to vote to approve moving forward, there's a number of things that I think Charles and myself could lay out. Um, but we would actually have to get the approval of the council to even move forward with it if we wanted to try to offset that cost this fiscal year. Um, in our current times, I think it's very important um, transparency, part of 21st century policing model. Um, I've been here since May of 2019, and I made it no secret when I interviewed that this is one of the things that I thought was very important for our department. Um, but we also got to look at the fiscal considerations too, whether or not we can afford it, because once you go to a system like this, you, you have to keep the system. And um, so we have to weigh our ability to pay for it, I understand that, with the needs of our department and the community. And so we were given two quotes and two proposals. One was for the 166385, which is a pay as you go for the cloud storage portion. So the cloud storage portion, it costs $360 per year per terabyte for cloud. What that translates to is if you were to use six terabytes, it would cost us $2,160. If we were to use 12 terabytes, $4,320. If we were to use 25 terabytes, it would cost us $9,000. So if we wanted to just look at going to an unlimited system, 
so we didn't have to worry about whether we're going to run over or not. The difference between the pay-as-you-go and unlimited is 8794 And if you look down here at 25 terabytes, that's $9,000. Our break-even is just shy of 25 terabytes. I really don't think that there's any way that we would break the threshold of 24 terabyte, 25 terabytes uh, within the first two years. It's possible the second year, highly unlikely, uh, year one, more likely than not, not year two. Uh, talking with body-worn camera system with WatchGuard, we could, at some time during our contract period, upgrade mm -hmm. at no cost, no release negotiations or anything like that, to unlimited. But once you do that, you can't go back. So for me, um, looking at Millsboro Police Department for an example, they have 10 cars, I believe, um, with in-car cameras. And they have body-worn cameras they've had since about 2016, and they use about six terabytes. Now, to be in all fairness, they're not, they don't handle nearly the volume of complaints that we handle, and we have more officers that would be wearing more body-worn cameras. And so I think that our usage would be higher than theirs. But they've been in the system now for about six years. And what happens is you have to determine what your retention is going to be for your storage policies. And in order to be eligible for grants, if you're looking at federal grant monies, you need to be compliant with your storage, your retention, in comparison to what the U.S. Attorney's Office says based on federal guidelines. And so that's going to recall call us to hold things a little bit longer than what you might normally otherwise do. It's even a little higher than the Delaware Attorney General's Office recommends. So my recommendation is that we follow those guidelines. And uh, I think we're still, if you decide to move forward, I think pay as you go is the way to go to get started if we choose to do that. Um, uh, I think there was a question that came up um, from Councilman Henderson earlier about, uh, about the uh, resolution and what we would want. And, you know, in discussions with the, the vendor and even with the chief from Millsboro, and um, typically these cars, the in-car camera systems for WatchGuard, they're set at 720 resolution all the time. So you can upgrade them or downgrade them. You can push a button and go up to 1080p or push the button based on whatever the stop is or the interaction is and downgrade it to 480. One of the things that's very important for law enforcement in general is that you never want to record anything that's going to be better than your, your eyesight because it's not realistic to expect an officer to see something on a camera that's much better, higher resolution than your eyesight. As you can imagine, that could cause a lot of issues. So, but you want to be able to see clearly, as Councilman Henderson pointed out earlier. The in-car um, in is set at 480, but you can upgrade it to a highest level of 720. So body-worn 720 is where it's set. You can go up or down. In-cars are set at 480. You can only go up to 720. So you can't go to 1080p in the in-cars. And from my understanding, when you're dealing with basic traffic stops and things of that nature, you're, you're typically, your storage is going to be shorter periods of time. Your resolution, you do want to have probably around 720 because you never know what's going to happen during a traffic stop. And um, the officer has that ability to adjust it up or down. You can put settings in this system so that if it's coded as a felony or a misdemeanor, DUI, things of that nature, that it has to be set at a certain resolution and it has to be retained. It will automatically retain it and it will come up and tell you when it's time for the automatically either be dropped off or you can retain it permanently until the case is over. So there's a lot of really good features on this. And just for some clarification earlier when I talked about the cloud storage of this, your in-car camera, your body-worn cameras, everything is integrated together. It also gives you the ability to integrate the interview because it's all part of that integrated system. We have a surveillance system within the police department. I just want to clarify what I said earlier because what you can do, they have a, a system. It's called a case management software system, and it's inside of the evidencelibrary.com. It's the evidence management system for the storage of the data. You can upload the surveillance system video from your department because Department of Justice, and you often get requests for video for the parking lot, the hallways, the cells, and things of that nature. So it's all uploaded into this evidence system and all put with the integrated camera systems. And you can even scan in all your reports, any video that you might have out at the scene. So if you're doing a 
video of a crime scene, that information can be uploaded into the same evidence management system. It cuts down on the amount of resources that you need to manage the system. You're essentially uploading it, pushing it, sending a link, and then they have everything in one big package. And when you go to a system like this, you've got to expect there's going to be more manpower requirements, more drain on resources. So if we're going to do it, you want to have a system that's going to cause the least amount of resource drain <clears throat> as possible. Um, one of the things that I can tell you is in the last year, I've met with uh, three different companies. Our IT person, uh, Gary and Tricia, were both with us on, I believe, at least one, if not two, with two of them. And the third one we had to do by webinar because of COVID. And the most customer service friendly uh, interaction that I've had is with WatchGuard. I know other chiefs that have WatchGuard. We've been sent links with WatchGuard for other internal affairs investigations that we've done. So I kind of have the feeling that I trust the system. I trust the service. And our salesman that's here today that did the speak, uh, did the presentation earlier, I mean, is actually someone that actually did the installs of everything before. So he knows it from the back end and the front end. And to me, that's extremely important when you're dealing with someone. Um, and I've never had him miss a phone call. He's always gotten back to us. So it's always about that service. And that's one of the things that uh, on top of um, the cost factors, when we looked at Axon, they were much higher. Um, when we looked at the other company, they're not part of a state vendor. So if money's ever opened up for grants, we couldn't get money because they're not on the system. And so when you compare, when I did the comparison, uh, WatchGuard to me just kind of stood out as the front leader that I would support for our department moving forward. And we have a company uh, department now that's been tried and true. They've had the system since 08 and they've had body warrants since 2016. Uh, so I feel very comfortable uh, with that. And All right. I'm available to answer any questions you have. Any questions for the chief? Councilman Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, could you uh, explain how this acquisition may help us achieve our goals regarding 21st century policing if it does at all? So one of the pillars of the 21st century policing is transparency, right? Trust, trust relationships. And there's a lot of distrust, I think, in the country today for different reasons. And so you just can't take people's word for it. You got to earn the trust and you got to be able to show, you know, that you're doing things right. And if you can't show that you're doing things right and you're not doing things right, then, you know, quite frankly, <coughs> whose fault is that? So for me, this definitely would help meet one of the pillars of the 21st century. And we have been working diligently for the past nearly 18 months to hit every pillar that we can. And um, there's a lot of positive things that's happened within our department. And this is, my mind, is another way for us to hit that benchmark and to uh, you know, show our community that we are definitely willing to be transparent. So I think that answers the question, hopefully. Yes, it yeah. does. Thank you. I have a follow-up question, yes, sir. a financial question. Um, the the year one payment is due in fiscal year 21-22. Mm -hmm. How we, we had money budgeted for 2021. How are we going to square that? So I could answer that if you like. All right. So so the lease agreement, they typically set the payment August 1st of every year. So typically, or actually what would happen is if a whole lot of things worked out, we were to vote to approve it. There may have to be a bidding process, actually. Um, we have a lease agreement here. We, would, we could take delivery of everything, have the install, have everything done, and not have to make a payment technically until August 1st, which would be into our next fiscal year, be fully funded, and we wouldn't be standing here asking for unbudgeted expenditure money. But what my ask is and what my proposal is to help offset it somewhat to get started is um, I'm willing to go before the Violent Crime Committee and ask for a reallocation of funds um, to make up a portion of that first payment. And we can make that, if I'm correct, at any time between now and August the 1st. We don't have to wait until August the 1st. We can make it, but our next payment would be due August the 1st. And so when I asked, the ask was $15,000 to offset this $33,277 because we already have 8000 or so budgeted 
to replace a current old system. So really it's about 7,000 technically, I guess, of unbudgeted money. The others reallocated. If the Violent Crime Committee would allow me to reallocate the difference, then that would save the city of about 18,000 and change. And so um, it wasn't put on the Violent Crime Fund initially because we weren't at this point yet to be able to present it to council. And my fear was is that if we put it on there, anything that's 20% or more of your allocated funds has to have approval of the board. They may not approve it and we might lose the funding. So I didn't want to take that risk. I feel very comfortable that it's much easier to get it approved for something this important than it would be to take something this important off the table. So even if you approved it today, I still would have to have that approval of the Violent Crime Fund Board. Right. And, and I think to maybe dive a little deeper into the councilman's question, we currently have a draft lease agreement in front of us from WatchGuard. There are some questions as we've reviewed that through finance management and police department related to are they on the state contract? Does that meet our bidding requirement in the charter? If it turns out that does not, then as the chief alluded to, we may have to bid it. The way this lease arrangement is made, yes, you're correct. The first payment would not technically be due until next budget year. So council could plan for that. Council could put that in our FY22 budget. If they are not the successful bidder, if we go through the bidding process, a, a different lease arrangement from a different vendor may look different the flows of money may occur at different times. But if council's committed to support the chief in moving forward with integrated body worn and in-car camera system replacement that we need, upgrade and replacement, then staff will do its due diligence to make sure everything is correct and will, you know, bring that back to council whatever direction we have to go based on advice of legal and finance. That helps, but I'm not sure if we're, if we're if we're not going to expend any funds in fiscal year 21, why would it be an unbudgeted expenditure? Okay, in, under this scenario, in this lease, lease agreement, technically it would not, okay? But council has to approve the change in the budget because we're going to spend this money differently. We also might want to consider talking with the director of finance because we aren't going to spend money <coughs> on the in-car camera replacement if this is the outcome maybe we put that in a sinking fund uh, because this amount that we're looking at over the next five years is in addition to our budget. So anything we can, you know, utilize this year for going forward we, would help us in our next budget cycle. Right. I'm, I'm all for that. I mean, if... Yes, sir. You know, it, it just... It's... Uh, semantics. Somewhat semantics, you, you yes, sir. You want to spend the money, mm -hmm. but... It's not going to be in this year. It's a timing and thing. And if you want to put it in a set-aside account, that's, that's fine, or else it would just be all loaded up onto the 21-22 budget, and then you, you just would not spend that money this year. Yeah, I think as the chief suggests, if we get down to the end of this budget year, our cash flow is good, I think we make a prepayment if this is the vendor we go with. That way that's behind us in this fiscal year <coughs> if everything turns out. The bigger question for council today, because all the details are not worked out, do we want to proceed with body-worn, integrated, in-car camera system now, sooner rather than later? That's really the big question. It may or may not be WatchGuard. I would recommend we modify the motion to eliminate the specific vendor. If it works out, that, that's the chief's recommendation that we go with, because you've seen their proprietary technology, you've seen the advantages that they have. If it works out that they can meet the state bidding requirements, we'll move forward with that. If, if it doesn't and we can't do that, then we'll have to go through a process and we'll bring back some bid results to council in the mm -hmm. next, I'm gonna say 60 days. Okay. Does that make sense? Any other questions from council? Uh, uh, yeah, Councilman Santos here. Um, what happens in year six? Is that, are we done paying and then or I don't want to step out on a limb here. Certainly the experts are here, but our lease agreement would be finished. I believe the equipment's ours at that point. We can talk with the company about what upgrades are necessary for them to continue their warranty. At that point, I think something that, that Councilman McCoy said, at, at five years in, there's probably going to be some new technologies out there we want to take advantage of. Um, 
I, I'm, you know, we might be able to get another year or two out of them, maybe, but I probably wouldn't count on it. I'd probably look at this as something that's going to be a continuing cycle moving forward every five years or so. Yeah. You know, maybe the in-car cameras don't need to be because the experience is there, they're lasting eight, nine, ten years. Um, so maybe it won't be as much, but I think you can count on once you get into this technology, it's going to continue to cost and, and need to be upgraded, need to be maintained. More, I was more referring to the, uh, the storage. Uh, do we, do we, will we continue to pay for storage or? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. yeah, store. And one of the things that the chief touched on is retention schedules. So certain things have to be retained for a certain amount of time. And what they'll do during their maintenance is, and I don't know the numbers, I'm going to say this all wrong, but a, a normal traffic stop might only be need to maintain for a very brief period of time. But if you have a violent crime, that's a whole nother thing that we have to keep for a lot longer. So they'll maintain this retention schedule and we'll have this kind of rolling data that will always be maintained and need to be accessible by our law enforcement people. Thank Did you. I state that close to correct, Chief? You did a pretty good job, better than me probably. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Councilman McCord. Just for clarification, if we were to stick with the older system, mm -hmm. that is what the $8,000 would come into play. That, that's the estimated figure. Yeah, we, we were just planning to replace before yep. we have an unbudgeted issue, yep. uh, an older, worn out, you know, aging system. Going this direction, the additional 7000 is going to allow us to upgrade to the body cameras and all the, the stuff that we're looking for here. What it would do is help me offset the cost so that we could afford yep. to reallocate a portion of our yep. current violent crime fund. So it offsets the city's yep. cost and it offsets our budget costs related to grants. Thanks for clarifying. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions? Councilman Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just for my clarification, even though we vote tonight, there's still a there's still more due diligence that needs to be done by administration and the and the chief. You are correct, and it has to involve finance as well as our city attorney because the lease agreement has to be reviewed and approved by both those entities as well. So yes, sir. I will say that um, the pricing that we've got is based off the uh, state of Virginia's contract pricing. So our body worn cameras have a no fault warranty for five years cost us nothing if they get damaged, broken, or anything. If the car's in an accident and the in-car camera gets injured or damaged, it would be replaced by our insurance company, just for clarification of the policy, because the lease does outlie that. Um, so talking with Charles, it sounded like uh, they don't have an actual pricing for the state of Delaware. They are an authorized vendor for the state of Delaware. If monies was ever to be released, it has to be, uh, you have to have a, a contractor that's authorized by the state of Delaware. They meet that requirement. Um, in all fairness, too, the, there is a proposal that's been going around now for a number of months where the state is talking about trying to provide storage just for body-worn cameras at no cost. Whether that comes about or not, I don't know, but I can tell you that it's part of Vault. Vault is actually part of WatchGuard. Am I correct? So it's all part of that. As I said earlier, the problem with that is if they only do it for body warrants, you no longer have an integrated system. You're paying for an integrated system. Yeah. If we wanted to go that route at this point, maybe we're better off to put a Band-Aid on what we have and purchase the cameras. I don't recommend that because you're going to run into problems. Um, so that's just something to think about. Okay. One more? I would, I would ask that, you know, we, if we move forward, that. Uh, as you talk to other people in your circle of influence to, to lobby for an apportionment of the body-worn cameras uh, funding, if, if it does happen, that way we get some compensation for the body-worn cameras, even though they're not right. uh, covering the mobile uh, cameras. So that way we're not, you know, we get some help with it, but so you know, if you're talking to your legislators or talking to other people um, in your circle to, um, to try to lobby for, for that, to get some apportionment for our investment. Just Thank to you. be clear, I have reached out to a number of folks within our circle, the chief's circle, and if we enter into this contract, 
I can tell you we're more likely than not, we won't be eligible for any kind of reimbursement or funding because we've entered into a contract prior to any funding becoming available. You know, so if we enter and we pay every five years, one, once a year for five years, that's it. We're not going to get any funding, but there's no guarantee that there's going to become any funding available. One would think at some point um, bigger departments are going to be moving in this direction, quite frankly. There's people probably lining up. Well, I know there's people lining up to try to get on board. We've been trying this for a year now to find a good fit for our department. We think we found it. But at the same time, government's catching up with the funding portion of it. It could be a year. It could be two years. If they come out two years from now and say we're going to help fund X amount of dollars, we won't be entitled to that, just to be clear, because we've already entered into an agreement. Okay. Now, whether or not that comes into play for the storage of just body-worn cameras, and then you have to essentially – bifurcate your system, and it, I wouldn't recommend it. Okay. Well, there's also um, the, the consideration if the state ends up mandating this and they fund it, how could they possibly exclude you if you're already in a contract? If they mandate it? If, so if it's mandated that your department will have body-worn cameras, which is not out of the realm of... Uh, consideration you know if the state passes legislation that says that or or the department of justice says that you will have it then uh, it, it won't be a, an unfunded mandate that would that would upset a lot of people and if they're going to partially or partially fund it then they would need to regardless of whether you're in a contract they, they should they shouldn't discriminate you against you as a municipality from others that haven't uh, engaged already. I, I would like to agree with you. However, I will say that um, what you'll probably see more likely than not is state and federal grant monies will be tied to it. So it's not like they can mandate you do it, but they can withhold grant monies. Two different things, two different mm -hmm. animals, which right. essentially is mandating it yeah. because you can't really survive without your grant money. Right. Right. So I, I think it's just, I just want to make it clear. We entered a contract. I would push as hard as I can. I've already been lobbying for that, but I don't anticipate us getting any access to funds to offset the cost once we enter the contract for this contract. That doesn't okay. mean something won't come up down the road. Um, okay. And it doesn't mean that the tides won't change. It's just that's the right now that's the information that's coming back down from Homeland Security. Okay. Too. All right. If there are no other questions, I'll accept the motion. And again, if you're going to make a positive motion city manager encouraged that we remove the vendors name from the motion Thank you, mm -hmm. mr. mayor I I would like to present um, an altered motion to make a motion to approve the request of chief of police Marshal Kraft to enter into a due diligence phase to fund the purchase of integrated body worn an in-car camera system for the Seaford Police Department staff in fiscal year 21. Um, that's the end. Okay. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Councilman Santos, I'll second it. Okay, thank you. Tracy, can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilman Santos. Aye. Councilman Henderson. Aye. Councilman Holland. Aye. Councilman McCoy. Aye. Okay, it's unanimous, Chief. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. I also want to thank, thank our staff on the technology side for preparing for this for the last two or three or four years. We've been gearing up for this budget-wise, and so, Tricia and Gary, thank you so much. All right, next we have the switch gear and wire. Mr. Bennett's coming down to present. Good evening, Mayor and Council and City Manager. Good evening. Good evening. Um, October 7th, we, well, previously we put out bids to purchase seven uh, pad-mounted switchgear cabinets and 10,500 feet of 750 MCM wire, underground wire. October 7th, we opened the bids. We got three bids in. Um, on one item, I hadn't put a line for the price. It had the item in there and how many we wanted, but I didn't leave a line for the price. Um, one bid came in, they hadn't priced that item. Um, the other two vendors just wrote it in the column. 
Um, so I went, reached back to that vendor and asked them for a price. I got my price. Um, the low bid didn't change. Um, the low bid stayed the same because that other one would have been considered incomplete. Um, so we received three bids. All three bids met the requirements. I would like to recommend going with the low bid from Annexter for the cost of $192,401.08. The estimated delivery time of the switch gear is 12 to 14 weeks. The wire, you don't get an estimate until you send in the PO. Um, the money for the material is in the bond bill. That's been approved by the state of Delaware, and you know it's already been approved and allocated. This material is for the uh, the infrastructure to put in the entrance to Ross Business Park North, the entrance that would we're working on. So, yes, sir. so I recommend uh, Annexter at one hundred ninety-two thousand four hundred one dollars and eight cents. Okay. Are there any questions in reference to this bid for the switchgear and wire? Yes. Yes, sir. The, the, the lump sum bid includes the current pricing for the wire? Yes. So we're just at, at the mercy of the commodities when you... Well, the, the price the is good, but they can't give you an estimated delivery time, time. until you okay. place the order because yeah. depending on how many orders come in between this bid and when we place our order. Okay. So they won't give you an estimated delivery time until you place the order. Wire has been running about the same uh, 10 to 16 weeks on wire. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? If not, I'll accept the motion. Councilman Holland, Mr. Mayor, I make the motion to accept the bid from Amster for the purchase of the 14.4 KV pad mount switch gear and wire in the amount of 192401 and eight cents as presented. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Councilman McCoy, I'll second. Okay, thank you. Tracy, can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilman Santos? Aye. Councilman Henderson? Aye. Councilman Holland? Aye. Councilman McCoy? Aye. Okay, it's unanimous. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate all your work thank on you. this. Yep. All right, next we have the bids on the zero turn mowers. <coughs> Trisha's doing this. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, council has in their packets the recommendation from our superintendent um, of Parks and Recreation, Katie Hickey. They did, we did receive bids on October 7th. Five bids were received for the 2020 zero term mowers. Um, the first two um, you'll see on your list, the first two actually low bid um, mowers, a, being a Bad Boy Rebel and a Ferris. Um, in review of the spec sheets, they did not meet our specifications um, by one not having um, the um, the mulching kit um, in the specification and the other being um, a greasable spindle. Um, we've had some issues with that. So you'll notice then the next two appear to be the low bid. However, they don't offer a trade-in value. So it's the recommendation of the department to award the bid to Atlantic Tractor um, for the two John Deere um, Z930 mowers to include the three bagging um, system that was an optional item. So that would make the total um, $19,415.45, which does come in under the budgeted amount. Okay, are there any questions on the bids for the zero turn mowers? If not, I'll accept the motion. Councilman Hall. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion to accept the bid from Atlanta Tractor for the purchase of two 2020 zero turn mowers in the amount of $16,303.16 with the optional three bag bagger system in the amount of $3,112.29 for a total purchase amount of $19,415.45 as presented. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Councilman McCoy, I will second. Okay. All right. Can we have a roll call vote, Tracy? Councilman Santos? Aye. Councilman Henderson? Aye. Councilman Holland? Aye. Councilman McCoy? Aye. Aye. Okay, Chairman. Yes, sir? Hi, Greg Atkins from Atkins. Uh, uh, the bad, did, 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 did I meet the spec? The, uh, the bad boy rebel um, did not have uh, neither, neither one had a mulching kit. Uh, the bad boy did not have reasonable spindle, that's correct. But the mulching kit was an add-on option. Was an add-on option. Yes, correct. It wasn't it wasn't included and would have been an additional cost. It would have been an additional cost. It wasn't 
Can you guys talk about that outside, yeah. if you don't mind? Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Next, old business. Okay. So tonight we have uh, the second reading of a proposed ordinance revisions to the Munic Municipal Code Division Three High Density Residential District, Section 15-26 Area and Bulk Regulations to change the permitted dwelling units per acre, setbacks, site coverage, habitable floor area, exterior materials, safety improvements, and site amenities. So the R3 zoning is what this is focused on, and that is our high density residential district. And as we stated in the first reading, this has been in the works for uh, quite some time, and staff has worked with the mayor and the vice mayor to look at some massaging to the existing code. The existing code's been in place since the mid-70s, and it really has not been modernized <clears throat> uh, with all the new regulations that are in place. So just to touch on some of the highlights and the changes, uh, we've, we're proposing to increase the site area from one acre to four acre minimum, so make the sites a little larger. Dwelling units per acre, we reduced from 14 down to 10. And then um, dwelling units per apartment building would go down from 18 to 12. All the setbacks would increase. So the building setback line would go from 25 to 50 feet. So they'd be set back further. The side yards would also be increased from 25 to 50. Building separation is further defined. There'd be 25 feet minimum between buildings. We'd increase the size of the units so they would be going up, a two bedroom unit would be um, 1,000 square feet, and then more than that would be 1,200 square feet, so the units inside would get larger. And then exterior materials, all the walls that are exterior to any of the buildings that would be built would be built with, finished with architectural masonry units, um, brick, stone, things of that nature. Um, site amenities. Every development must include a community center for use by the residents with a minimum square footage of 1,200 square feet, a play area for neighborhood children with a minimum of three acres in area, and then safety and security, the community-wide camera system would be required, all the parking lots, all the exterior areas, common areas. And then um, we would also, for safety and security, would require fencing of the site perimeter uh, for the units. So that's generally it in a nutshell. This would be the second reading. So as with any ordinance, should council decide to adopt it this evening, we would advertise it and then it would become effective. As we stated during the first reading, um, the building official did check projects in the pipeline. Currently there are no R3 projects in the pipeline that this would affect. So we wouldn't um, harm anyone that's in the pipeline currently. If council adopted this, anyone, any developer that came forward with a set of plans, we would share with them the new code requirements as they develop their plans. So okay. certainly I can answer any questions if council has any. Yep. Okay, are there any questions in reference to the change in the municipal code? Yes, yes sir, Councilman Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, do you have any knowledge of approved R3 developments that are not yet in progress? Um, like you say in the pipeline, I mean, there, those would be in progress. Have, have there been some that have been approved that are not affected that, or that would not be affected by this ordinance? I think in talking with the building official, no. Everyone that's in the pipeline prior to this or is in the process has received final approval. And there is, a, there are, and I'll point that out, that's a good uh, point, Councilman. There are several that are approved, but have not yet begun construction. So they may wait, they may just start to develop in six, eight, 12, 18 months. And then, you know, we may have to go back and, and verify that they were approved under the old code change. So that's a good point. But, you know, no one is currently in the approval process, but the, yes, there are several that are approved and not yet started. Okay. Any other questions? This is not a public hearing. I'm not, sorry. Not, I'm sorry it's not a public hearing. Any other questions from council? If not, I'll accept the motion. 
Mr. Mayor, uh, Dan Henderson, Councilman, uh, I make a motion to adopt the revisions to the Municipal Code Division Three, High Density Residential District, Section 15 through 26, Area and Bulk Regulations to change the permitted dwelling units per acre, setbacks, site coverage, habitable, habitable floor area, exterior materials, safety improvements, and site amenities as presented. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Councilman Holland, Mr. Mayor, I second that motion. Okay, thank you. Tracy, can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilman Santos. <coughs> Aye. Councilman Henderson. Aye. Councilman Holland. Aye. Councilman McCoy. Aye. Aye. Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, reminders of meetings. Okay, we only have one. Uh, citywide Halloween trick-or-treating will be held October 31st, 2020 from 6 p.m. until 8 p.m. for children under 12 years of old, 12 years old, with proper COVID-19 precautions in place, contactless delivery of treats, social distancing, and cloth face coverings are recommended by the Division of Public Health. Uh, our city clerk, Tracy Torbert, has attached a flyer from the Department of Health and it outlines this um, very well. So if anyone is interested or wants to share this with any one member of the public, we're posting this information as well. So uh, trick or treat will go forward with some, it'll look different this year. Sure, okay, thank you very much. All right, we'll start off with committee reports with administration and IT with Councilman Santos. Thank you, Mayor, it's Councilman Santos. Um, there was inspection of the roof replacement at the police department and there were some um, I heard there were some repairs that were recommended uh, yes, sir. before it could be uh, I was also told that if the repairs cannot be done they might have to re scrap the roof and redo it okay uh, let's see The city met with the city engineer regarding the North uh, Ross Business Park development. They're working with the Department of Transportation to determine the improvements required to install the entrance on Her and Run uh, Road. They said they might need to widen the roads or there, there's a few things that they have to um, work on still. Uh, All right, uh, for the IT report, they completed the projects at the police department, mounted, like mounting the TV and the gyms, wiring up secured phones. Um, they met with the advanced security with regards to the security camera projects and this budget year. For the administration report, the, right now they're still working, um, they're getting audited. Uh, they're working through that right now. Um, they haven't scheduled the next meeting with the Teamsters, but uh, they had a meeting on October 1st. Uh, and that concludes my report. Okay, thank you very much. Next, we have police and fire. Councilman Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the, the report is submitted in its entirety. I'll go through a few highlights. Um, Chief Wilson's report alarms to date as of uh, October 12th. Fire and rescue are 589, averaging 2.05 calls per day. EMS is 2,546 calls year to date, averaging 8.9 calls per day. Um, significant uh, Significant calls within this period on September 26th, there was a working structure fire on Old Furnace Road and out of our district where we assisted um, on October 10th, um, we assisted Blades with a working structure fire on Lynx Road. Uh, under apparatus, the dive trailer is in for scheduled maintenance or uh, equipment service. Tower 87 did not pass its aerial certification for pump and flow reasons. That's water flow, not, not hydraulic flow. Um, and it's being 
reevaluated by a service center for recertification to be rescheduled. Um, uh, some of you may know, uh, may recall that we have uh, a new ambulance being specified and the bids were open <clears throat> and it passed its vote at the last meeting and the order has been placed. There are three new hires um, that will start their orientation on October 26th. Miguel Ruiz, Cedric Andrews, and Zach Middleton. If you encounter them, please welcome them to the Seaford volunteer fire department as uh, as career employees uh, under training the next training is uh, Wednesday October 21st with a pre-plan pre walkthrough at the Invista plant and uh, under events um, there were several um, fire prevention mini lessons that were on the Facebook page for in observance of National Fire Prevention Week, which was held last week, uh, the 4th of October through the 10th. And the EMS uh, service um, has engaged in a, an agreement with Middle Ford Speed, uh, Speedway as they uh, are doing ambulance coverage for them um, throughout the season, but especially um, the last race that they, their inaugural race on the 10th of October and the next one on the 17th. Um, you'll see reports <coughs> with distributions of time and day from the number of alarms that were provided by Second Assistant Chief Tom LeCates. You can, you can uh, if, if you're a numbers person, you can uh, start to see the the concentration of days and times and when they're most busy. Uh, the next page will show you the number and types of alarms uh, and their distribution. And below the dashed line, you'll see where we assisted other fire companies and did duty calls and those, those numbers and the distribution there. Uh, in <coughs> uh, in Chief Marshall Kraft's report for the Seaford Police Department, you'll see a, a chart showing uh, the number of instant, uh, incidents 2020 year to date, uh, along with two previous periods, 2019 and 2018. Uh, moving down, you'll see um, you'll see all, all complaints where there, there were 340 complaints in that period. Um, with an 86% clearance rate overall. You can see the dates and distribution in the crime view um, chart. You'll have to um, zoom, you can enlarge that in your document if, if uh, you're interested. In traffic, uh, there were 319 citations uh, written. Oh, there are three, 319 traffic contacts with 20, 92 citations written, four DUIs, 20 crashes. Out of those 20 crashes, only one involved an injury, thank, thankfully. And uh, you'll see a number of significant events um, that they uh, felt were worthy of uh, mention. The administration remains busy. Um, meeting, uh, namely uh, on the 6th of October, there was a, a SLEAF uh, grant meeting, meeting that the chief had, uh, and that, that determines uh, the allocation of funds um, for, the, for the next period. In training, the Supervisory Training Academy, which was um, uh, DC RAPA uh, attended and uh, SRO Justice did webinars and tabletop drills for school critical uh, incidences. And further on down, I, I would like, well, we participated earlier this evening in uh, um, meeting our new officers that were just sworn in and Finally, I would like to mention um, 
Just Justice, which is a video series with our high school principal, Dr. Horsey, and uh, on SRO matters along with SRO Justice. And uh, I, I think that'll be a, a pretty regular series coming up that, that'll interest you. So that, um, that's going to be all that, um, that, that pretty much does it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Next, we have Code Parks and Rec, Councilman Holland. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We are busily doing violation inspections throughout the city. In Mirrorfield, second duplex has been set and applied for a permit for a four-pack townhouse. And the Montessori School is open. <coughs> administrative offices and meal distribution building <coughs> is complete. And there is an opening for code inspection, if anybody is interested. And we move to Parks and Rec. They coordinated two volunteers with local church for trash pickup in our parks. And they submitted two grants for Sussex County Council for Riverfest and see for tomorrow. And they are in the process of brainstorming for ideals for alter alternative recreation activities for the upcoming winter. And all the work is routine. That concludes my report. Okay, thank you. And finally, we have a lecture, Councilman McCord. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, for the purpose of time, I'll hit a few highlights. Uh, as far as the crew is concerned, they recently set a poll with Verizon on Westland Lane, ran a new service on Nylon Boulevard. Um, they fixed the parking lot lights and the front flagpole lights at the police department. And uh, they killed the power to PNC Bank on Saturday and turned them back on Sunday for their maintenance. As far as upcoming weeks, we're going to continue changing the lights on Sussex Highway to LED, finish trimming the trees in Williams Pond Park, and get the estimate and schedule the directional drilling at Wawa. Uh, Mr. Merritt, a few highlights. The report's been submitted in its entirety. Okay, thank you very much. I also just want to thank our employees for helping us prepare for hosting the Sussex County Association of Towns meeting this past week where Councilman Henderson led. We had all the candidates running for office. We did a great job. I think uh, we made CIFA proud, but I know it takes a lot of work to prepare, so thank you all for, for doing that. And with that, I'll accept a motion to adjourn for executive session. Uh, Councilman McCoy, I'll make that motion. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Councilman Holland. Okay, Mr. thank Ramick, you. That motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, thank you.